Uh, I'm Joe Quinn, I'm the director of Center here, and I'm just going to briefly introduce Joe to you. He's kind of already been introduced to me uh, earlier today. Um, wonderful that you could hang on. Um, the glass of wine helped, I think. <laughs> um, just to put a bit of context to this, um, your work was mentioned this morning, and I'd like to just dwell it for a moment which is personhood. The idea that lurking behind the body, there's some essence, some entity, and if you're halfway as religious, some soul, that we wish to protect and nurture and empower. The problem with the accident of the Enlightenment was that how it narrowed down our conception of personhood, to cognitive ability, cognitive capacity. Your capacity to rationally understand the world, to rationally understand your life choices, to rationally make a decision, and to rationally communicate that, that to third parties. What if you didn't have that capacity? Uh, believe it or believe it not, and this was touched on this morning, um, in the field of ethics of all places, there is a domain called the moral considerability of persons, whereby if you lack that essential characteristic, you're not actually deemed a person, or you're deemed of lesser moral worth as a person. That's a high uh, uh, cliff to climb. Um, it gives rise to the perception that will maybe the impact of the intellectual disability is so profound that what we have presenting before us partakes of the shape of a human but actually isn't a person. There isn't a person there. So the quest for the way of the preference of the person is a wild goose chase. Or, if that person is there, but nevertheless so clouded by the intellectual disability that we can never hope to understand them, their soul, their values, their preferences, their choices in life, if they can't communicate that, then they may as well not be there. And therefore, the best we can do is find a mechanism for actually protecting them. And perversity of perversity, you protect by taking away their voice through guardianship. What a contradiction in terms. So we've been used to the rhetoric and it's kind of no more than legal rhetoric, and Mita was trying to get at this this morning, that now we have to switch things around and start exploring the will and preference of the person. Well and good. How do you actually do it? Um, what techniques are available to give us confidence that what we're reaching is not just an echo of who we are, but is actually some sort of resonance of who they are? As a person. Here enters Joe Watson, and you're really in for a treat tonight. Because Joe's thesis was not about abstract generalities, about new text, techniques of discovery uh, to reach the person and to extract their life choices and their personhood and then to respect it. But it was all about techniques and valid techniques by which we can do that and we can convince third parties like bankers, like landlords, like dentists, like doctors that what we are retrieving is authentically the self. Yeah. It's still an evolving science, it's still an evolving art, but this art and science is stimulated into existence by the treaty because the treaty tells us stop doing what we did in the past have faith that we can find ways of retrieving the self, and now to that faith, she is adding the hard science and the art and the craft of actually using valid techniques to discover the person. So that was the way I was going to introduce Joe. I could say a few more things about Melbourne versus Sydney and the Sydney guy. Uh, about Australian folk music, but maybe we'll leave that to later on. So without further ado, over to Joe. Thank you, Gerard, and, and thank you so much.
much for um, bringing me here. It's so exciting to be in Galway. It's, I've never been here and it's such a beautiful place. Um, it, it just really is amazing. I spent, um, I used to live in Tasmania and um, I remember that time in Tasmania when I was young, when I, I lived there. And walking through your um, city reminds me very much of those feelings of, of um, inclusion and feeling welcomed. And it, it's, um, it's yes, yeah, it's, it's a lovely city. So thank you for being so welcoming, and thanks for putting on this great weather because I hear it's not actually that great. Um, and I'd also like to thank Maria for Maria Walls for bringing me for, for um, inviting me to come um, uh, and talk tonight. Um, that was that was lovely of you, so thank you. Okay, so um, who are we talking about tonight? Oh, actually, before I start, I'd like to get a real feel for who is in the room. I've got a feeling there's a few speech pathologists. Yeah, yeah, yeah? people. Yeah, speechies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, speechy is the term that we will use in Australia. I think. Yeah. Do you use it here? No, anyway, speech. Um, yeah. So, um, speech pathologists are, are people that, uh, professionals that work with people who um, have difficulty with communication. So that's my background. Um, who else have we got in the room? Just yell out. It's all good. Lawyers. <laughs> lawyers, lots of lawyers. <laughs> so, so excuse me if I, if I, um, I'm not a lawyer. So, um, yeah, we it might use a little bit different language, but and the other thing I want to say is before I begin, sorry, self-advocate, self-advocate's fantastic, and I just just met you, so that's yeah. that's great, and I'm sure there's other advocates around. Yes. Yep, we're all advocates, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so um, what I'd like to do is make this as interactive as possible. There's a lot of wisdom in the room, um, and as Gerard said, this is an evolving um, uh, time um, in, in our knowledge of how to connect to people who don't use intentional or maybe informal communication. So who am I talking about here? I'm talking about people who communicate informally, and what that means is that they don't use speech predominantly to communicate. They may use facial expression, they may use gesture, they may use behaviour that many people are challenged by. Um, uh, they may communicate unintentionally. So the speech is in the room, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> when I say you're an, someone is communicating unintentionally. What that means is that they're communicating without an understanding that their behaviour will have an impact on someone else. They are indeed communicating them. And the reason why they're communicating is because communication partners react to that communication and they respond to that communication. So we'll talk a little, we'll unpack that a little more, that communication hierarchy, well, actually not a hierarchy, let's not call it a hierarchy, the continuum, the human communication continuum. And it's worth noting that um, we all communicate unintentionally. We all communicate informally. Now, all of us in this room, I believe, communicate also symbolically or formally. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's times in our lives where we are in a position where we, are un we communicate unintentionally. And that might be because we're in a situation where we are under stress, we um, uh, may be using unintentional communication. Um, those of you who were here today will, will, will know the example that I used of, of me when I need coffee in the morning. If it doesn't come when I need it from my husband, I will make a certain noise and I will roll over. He knows very clearly that that means get the espresso. <laughs> she won't get up before the espresso. Um, 
So I'm not communicating, because I'm half asleep, but I'm not communicating in, uh, uh, intentionally. But I'm certainly communicating because I get what I want. Um, and he responds to that. <laughs> so um, I know that not everyone has been here today. How many of you have come um, who aren't at the summer school that are here, just to, for me to get it. There's a, quite a lot of you, okay. So, for those of you who were here today, um, I will be repeating some of um, what I've presented, but I also need to give you, particularly some of the speeches in the room, you might not be aware of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which says that um, the first principle of that convention by the way, Ireland has, has not ratified the convention, but you're planning on it. Gerard's going to make that happen too. Um, so, uh, the first principle is respect for inherent dignity, individual autonomy, including the freedom to make one's own choices, and independence of person. So it's all about autonomy, that, that first principle. Um, and Article 12, which is the article that I'm most interested in and has driven so much of my work, is, um, says that people, persons, I'm not sure why you lawyers don't just say people. Yes. Why persons? Yeah. <laughs> people with disabilities enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with others in all aspects of life. It stresses the importance of supportive approaches to decision making, stating that signatory nations shall take appropriate measures to provide access by persons with disabilities to the support they may require in exercising their legal capacity. Now, that sounds like a whole lot of legalese. Yes. It was really important for me to see that it's particularly when my country, when my nation, Australia, ratified the convention. And I must say, just because you ratify something doesn't mean you've got your house in order. But just putting that out there, so you, there's, no, there's no shame. <laughs> um, uh, so when I saw that article, I went, wow, finally there might be a mechanism for the people that I have supported um, all my life as a sibling and um, as a speech pathologist, um, there might be a mechanism for them to have their will and preference heard, for them to have their personhood realised, because it's enshrined in this convention. So I got pretty excited about this. And what Article 12 is talking about is this idea of supported decision-making. So everyone has the right to be supported, to realise their autonomy. Yeah. Everyone. And when I look at my experience um, for the people that I've supported over the years, there's been lots of movements around self-determination. Um, the 80s, you know, we saw this self-determination movement, we saw person-centred practice, which was really important, particularly in this country um, and in the UK. Uh, but what, and it was terrific, because it was giving a voice for so many people. But what I kept coming up against was that there was these people that were communicating informally or unintentionally that didn't, that, that weren't part of this process. They, it seemed to me that they weren't deemed important enough to be self-determined. So again, that notion of personhood, really, you know, really, they don't really matter that much <coughs> the way I perceived it. So when, Article, when the UNCRPD came about and Australia ratified the convention and when, um, uh, when, I, when I read Article 12, I thought this might be the answer. So this is where my quest started. Um, around around this work. <coughs> so what we know is that it's not rocket science, really. No. <laughs> communication is power. <coughs> the more autonomous you are, the less likely you are to have complex communication support needs. So if you don't 
if, if you don't have a good, a clear voice, if you can't have your voice, if you heard, it's very difficult to lead an autonomous life. So have a think about the people that you know, the most articulate people, the people who are using formal, very articulate language. Everyone in this room. Um, we have that, we have a gift. We are, um, it's a vehicle to our self-determination. It's a vehicle to our autonomy. So, um, so this is what we know, and there's a lot of research around this. Roger Stancliffe from New South Wales, Michael Weimer, which I always pronounce wrongly, but Gerard, how do I say Weimer? Weimer. Michael. Anyway, obviously that's okay because no one will Michael Weimer um, has done a lot of work in this space around the the importance of communication when it comes to self-determination. And it really isn't that hard to fathom, you know, it makes sense. If I have a voice, I'm more likely to be able to um, have my will and preference heard. Um, so what I'm going to do over the next hour or so is, is share with you some of my learnings um, that have been gleaned from my research and practice over the years around the realisation of autonomy for, for people who, who perhaps communicate a little differently. Um, and I've just touched on this, but I think that this, I really want to um, uh, talk about this because I think that these people are some of the most disempowered people on our planet. And um, as has been the case with self-determination movements of the past, such as self-advocacy and person-centred practice, Opportunities for supported decision making appear to be dominated by people with less complex communication and cognitive support needs, whose decision making capability is less likely to be questioned. Yeah. No, that's all right because we're not using that, we're using my Mac. Yeah? <laughs> we, were, we were just talking before because we couldn't get that to work and it was all, we were just wondering why the world can't get along. Why can't PCs and Macs? <laughs> oh, I've got my Mac now, so that's, it's all that's very the good. Problem <coughs> with the that's the problem with the um, That's the problem with the <coughs> Oh, I know. Isn't that? I know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think what I'm interested in is why is this the case? Why is this group of people always always, in my opinion, ignored, always um, uh, not heard. And I think there's a few reasons for that, um, and we've touched on those today, uh, these characterisations of personhood, and that's what Gerard talked about before, um, that these characterisations of personhood or humanness are still linked to this idea of cognition. We have a hierarchical um, uh, hierarchy around humanness that is linked to cognition. So you think those of you who are parents um, or who are not, how proud are you when your child gets that A? It's so important, isn't it? Because intellectually they're going to make it in the world and that's really important. So we had this hierarchy of cognition, the, the hierarchy of humanness based on our cognition. So where does that leave people with an intellectual disability? Where does that leave people who, um, by the very nature of their disability, are not able to get that A? Um, and I think it also stems this neglect of this, these people is is an understandings of what communication is. And that's what I want to explore with you a little more. I want to talk about that human, that human communication continuum. Um, I think the other thing that we touched on a little bit today, there was a terrific question that someone asked, and that was around that dilemma of interpretation. For this group of people, it is very difficult. And we are in a very privileged position, but a very difficult position as supporters, are we going to get it right? And if we don't get it right, what does that mean for this group of people? But my feeling about that is, if we don't try, what does that mean for this group of people? 
We have to try. So the work that I've been doing is trying to work out how we can assist that person to have their will and preference heard. Um, so this is the human communication continuum. Speechy is amongst us. Um, you can switch off for a bit because I know you know all about this. Um, but for the rest of us, I think it's important to understand this framework. So communication can be described as progressing through a series of stages. Okay, so if we think about developmentally how communication um, uh, develops. We start as unintentional communicators. And I'm not saying that the people that we're talking about here are infants, but I get, I'm talking, I'm giving you this framework to help you understand what I mean um, about this communication continuum. So, at one end of the continuum, we have this formal communication. Some might call symbolic communication, and that's how I'm communicating now. I'm using symbols, I'm using language, I'm using very, very abstract thought. Okay? So, someone who is a formal communicator uses language, uses symbols. They may communicate with no words because they might use sign language or they might use an augmentative or alternative communication device, which involves them typing or understanding symbols to have their voice output. So I'm not saying that everyone, just because you don't use speech to communicate, you're not a, not a formal communicator. I, many of the people, um, many of my friends communicate formally but don't use speech. Yeah, so they might use sign language. Um, uh, Auslan. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've got a sign right here. Um, so that's very much a language in itself. So that's formal communication. Someone who uses an electronic or a voice output device is still using formal communication. But then this <coughs> other end of the, uh, the continuum, I've got to not use, I've really don't want to use that word hierarchy, and I'm not sure why it keeps coming out because I don't, if it's not a hierarchy, it's a continuum. Yeah. Um, uh, is this idea that, um, so these last two, intentional, informal, and, and unintentional, we're talking about people who communicate informally. So they're not using language. So they might. Um, communicate by pointing to, I want that, I really want that blue laptop because that is a really nice blue laptop. So I might not say that, but I might, okay? Or I might <laughs> point to, it's a nice laptop. I might point to a fridge and then look at someone, okay? I'm communicating very clearly that I might want something out of that fridge. A beer. <laughs> um, um, uh, so I am communicating and I'm communicating intentionally because I'm, I understand that you're going to give me what I want. But I'm not communicating formally, I'm not using language. Then another, uh, another part of that, another type of informal communication is this concept of unintentional communication, which we've talked about. But I just want to get that um, through to you. So if we're talking about those of us who have had newborn babies, hands, <laughs> yeah. So remember when that baby was born. Um, <laughs> remember that first day. Did that baby communicate to you? Yeah, that baby communicated in the womb, yeah? That baby communicated to you. They didn't communicate intentionally, though. They didn't scream to say, come and change my nappy. Diaper, where are we? Nappy. Um, um, so their dad would come and change it. They, didn't, they weren't intentionally saying, I need a, a fresh bum. But they were communicating that they were really, really uncomfortable 
And when Dad got up, because he did, and <laughs> changed that nappy, that baby stopped crying. Yeah, that's great. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, I've got a good one. <laughs> um, uh, so there was certainly communication there. That baby communicated, but not intentionally. And then as time went on, baby Archie, who's my youngest, would go, ooh, every time I cry, Dad comes. Ooh, ooh, there's starting to be a link. So we're starting to develop intentional communication. Starting to understand that if I cry, Dad comes and he might tickle me or I get a cuddle. Ooh. And then gradually, Archie starts to realise that if I say that, 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 not mum, that, <laughs> Dad starts to come. Then I say Dad, and then I'm a symbolic communicator, I'm a formal communicator. And so that happens around about six months of age. So I really am sometimes uncomfortable talking about that framework um, because I know it makes people feel uncomfortable because we are talking about babies here. We're talking about adults. But it helps you to understand what communication is and that even though someone might communicate unintentionally, they're still communicating and their communication is just as valuable as the communication that I'm giving you now as a symbolic or a formal communicator. Yeah? yeah? Is that clear as mud? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, the other part of this, if we're thinking about this group of people, people who are communicating predominantly unintentionally, because you know, we all communicate unintentionally, but some people, some adults, commun communicate only unintentionally. So if we're thinking about that group, the onus of support, the onus of interpretation is on the support person. So thinking about Andy, my partner, who goes and changes Archie's nappy, the onus is on him to interpret that communication and then change his nappy. Yeah? Yell out if any of this is just not working for you because I'm really happy to, for this to be interactive. I don't think so. And I think that we need to acknowledge that there is, there are people who communicate in that way and always will. That they will never develop that intentionality when it comes to communication. And I know that's controversial. I do know that's controversial. But I think while we don't recognise that, well, we don't name it up, these people will continue to be disempowered and left out of movements like self-determination because they're not communicating intentionally. Yeah. So what we know about cognition is that a newborn baby doesn't do so intentionally, even though we think that they communicate intentionally, that they're screaming because they want us. They are communicating um, they are re they're, they're reacting physiologically to some discomfort in their body that, that, that then um, manifests as a scream. And then, as we respond and as we um, work with that person, or, or they begin to understand that this, their cognition changes and they begin to understand that if I do scream and if I change, maybe Dad will come. Okay, it's, it's a difficult concept and it's something that speech pathologists in the room have probably spent many years understanding. Um, but I wanted to just give you an overview of that. It's but a very good question. It's, yeah, I don't think I answered that. I, I think I, I, that, that probably, I think that maybe a better word for it to help you understand that would be cognitive intent. <laughs> 
Okay, so that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. This problem is Yeah, please chip in. <laughs> Just translating it into like Article 12 terms. It uses will yeah. and preference. Yeah. They're not exactly the same thing. I mean, will can be an instinctual reaction, but it's your will. Right? And Still the thought is that it's not being listened to. Uh, preference carries with it a connotation that you processed the information, you formed an autonomous decision about it, which is kind of like backward looking to the old system. And I guess what Joe is really saying is that will instinctual being in the world, just sentience in the world is really important. And that's captured by Article 12. That's the reason. Thank you. That's such a great word. Um, uh, and I think, I think that that is the point here. We struggle with this continuum because we, I think, most of us are still stuck in what Gerard would call that age of enlightenment where cognition is the boss. Cognition is key. So we struggle with what I'm saying because we think, oh, don't, don't say that their that the, that the cognition is that compromised. Please don't say that because that is such an insult. My point is it's not. That communication is just as valuable <coughs> as all of our communication. Okay. Why do we give a shit, sorry, give a care <laughs> about this continuum? Why do we care about that? And I can see that, like, why? Right, doesn't it, does it matter? It only matters because it gives us some clues as how to interact with this person yeah. and how to, to divine their will yeah. and Therefore, build that into preferences. If that's why it matters. Because it's, it's getting to the crux of how the hell we can do this thing that Article 12 wants us to do with people who communicate unintentionally or informally. Yeah? yeah? Nice. Okay. So we'll move on. <laughs> she has a headache, perhaps. <laughs> Not sure, but I don't think she is necessarily intentionally telling us that she has a headache. We might respond, she might be our colleague, we might respond okay. with, Are you okay? Did you have a hard night last night? Do you need a Panadol? Do you need a glass of water? Do you need a cuddle? We might respond, but she didn't realise that she was sitting at a desk going and everyone was watching. But she wasn't intentionally sending a message. Might have been, but um, <laughs> very intentional communication. Yeah. Screaming at her, at, at his big, yeah. at his big sister. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not necessarily. He may not be using words. Let's say he's not using words. If he's not using words, he's using informal communication. So he's screaming. Yeah. Ah! But he's certainly intentional. Um, yeah. intentionally um, sending a message. And here's some symbolic communication. So this person is whispering in that person's ear, they're using speech, very traditional. Yeah. Um, so again, the speech pathologists in the room will understand that that paradigm shift that happened around the 80s where this, where people who communicated unintentionally or informally were not considered communicators. And that was a really input. So, in, so that was a, for us. That was a really important time. People like Pat Miranda in Canada, um, uh, Dunst and Bruna, they started to talk about this group of people who oh, actually they communicated. And I just want to tell you um, when I worked in practice in the 80s in Victoria, I worked in a um, state-run institution. The government, there was a hierarchy um, of, of people who were able to have speech pathology services, so my services. So if someone, according to my assessment, um, was deemed an unintentional communicator, 
they didn't get my service, according to the government. So I was only able to give services, supports and services, to people who communicated formally, maybe a little bit of informal, but certainly people who were unintentional communicators did not receive a service. So that was a clear policy. You can look at um, Victorian government policy. They did not receive a service. Why? Because they didn't communicate. What would a speech pathologist need to, to do with someone who didn't communicate? Why? Perhaps they weren't personal people. So it wasn't until the mid-80s where we really fought for that and people like Pat Miranda um, came to Australia and helped us change some of that policy and said, this is bullshit. It's not going to, it can't continue because this group of people need our support. They are indeed communicating and we need to, um, to provide them with the supports they need to get their message across. Um, so Pat Miranda, Teresa Iacano, Val Williams um, came up with this mantra, all people, no matter how severe their level of disability, can and do attempt to communicate. I would change that and um, Pat would change, Pat Miranda would change that now to can and do communicate. But we can, yeah. And we, but we can, we can um, debate this kind of stuff until the cows come home, but we haven't got enough time. Um, uh, so, is self-determination a relevant concept? As Gerard talked about, we know that bioethicists, um, they continue to claim that if someone's not able to communicate in an intentional way, in a rational way, they cannot be self-determined. Self-determined and they lack personal. So, um, Peter Singer, many of you would know of his work. Um, uh, and this is a quote that Peter, um, in fairness, was in 1993, so it's a long time ago. And um, Peter, I, I knew Peter because he was in Melbourne, but then he went to Princeton. So, I haven't spoken to him about his views, but I do believe that he probably still holds some of these views. But um, I think this, this uh, quote is particularly uh, astounding. Um, such people, he's talking about people who communicate unintentionally, it is argued lack the capacity of reason, self-awareness and of self-determination. These attributes define personhood and consequently their absence means that an individual is lacking them, is therefore not a person. From this perspective, euthanasia for such non-persons is acceptable and indeed should be actively pursued. I want to share with you a quote from Gerard, um, a very recent quote in, um, uh, uh, what do you call that thing that you write before a book? Preface. Preface, that's the word. I was trying to think of it today. The preface that he's written um, around uh, for Anna Arstein Kerslake's new book, um, which really talks about, which really um, uh, um, <coughs> argues against this idea of singers. He talks about this age of enlightenment, as he talked about before, that probably has had the large, the are you checking if I got your quote correct? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, meaning the enlightenment, probably has the largely accidental effect of narrowing down our understanding of the essence of personhood, an essence that telescoped narrowly into cognitive ability. So what you are saying here is that there is still this hierarchy of humanness based on cognition. And it doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense. What makes a person a person? Surely it's about how they interact. Surely it's about relationships. Surely it's about their ability to love. Why? Why is it? Why do we hang so much still on this idea of cognition? Um, and, and we know that it's not only esteemed people like Peter Singer that have, have these views. 
um, this is a quote from, from one of my research participants who is a wonderful person. <laughs> um, but it, it's very interesting. She said, okay, so I get what you're saying. He, he, I, I get that you're saying you can make a decision. I get it. I get what you're saying. But I'm, I'm not sure you know him, do you? I had known him for many, many years. He can't tell us what he wants. He, she, we just decide shit for him. You know, no offence, but we have all these programs and stuff. But at the end of the day, people don't know who we're dealing with here. I mean, they, people don't know who we're dealing with. They just can't communicate. It's different for them. They can't tell us what they want, so we just have to get on with it and make decisions that we think are best for the guys. So there's this real focus on best interest here, which is contradictory to the convention. <coughs> and, and remember, this is in a nation that has ratified the convention. Um, at the end of the day, people don't know who we're dealing with here. They just can't communicate. It's different for them. They can't tell us what they want. So again, this group of people are different. They can't communicate. I don't think you understand, Joe. They, don't, they can't communicate. Because, you know, he can't communicate. He has a lot of brain damage, you know. So I shouldn't put it on that, that accent, but, you know, that's how it was said. He has a lot of brain damage, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have this dilemma of interpretation. I know that that's what we're sitting here going, yeah, all well and good, but we're talking about very abstract communication. What if we get this, this interpretation wrong? Who owns the message? Um, uh, but I think it's really important, I think I've already mentioned this, that we have a choice. We either rely on proxy interpretations that are likely to be unreliable, or we don't bother. Or we continue to have um, people who are unintentional communicators left in the too hard basket who, where, who, who will never have their right to autonomy realised. So the question then remains is how the hell do we do it? How do we do it? How can we be more reliable in our interpretation? And I think what happens is while we've had guardianship for all these years, while it's been okay to have guardianship, we haven't bothered with this group of people to try and work out what mechanisms do work because uh, they can, we'll just use substituted decision making for them. So I think it's a very new area where we're really starting to try and understand how can we delve into um, uh, the, the true self, the authentic self of someone. Um, so Petri and Mays from, help me, someone, uh, I think they're from, I don't want to get them wrong, I think they're from Belgium. Um, so they say we're faced with a quandary, either ignore these individuals because they cannot self-report or obtain data from proxies that may be biased or invalid. So we need to work out how we can do this. How can we make that data not not invalid or un, not unreliable. Um, and I think one of the things that we grapple with is certainly within my own country of Australia, we have a new national disability insurance scheme, which is all about individualised um, practice. So people have plans, person-centred plans, that are then funded. Um, it's a very exciting issue, but it's a very frustrating one. We could talk for years about it, but um, I, I think what's happening and what's, what I'm seeing and what I'm seeing in the individualised support literature from the UK particularly is that it, often we paint this idea of choice as really simple. All we need to do to live up to our obligations under Article 12 is just let people do what they want. Give them, give them choice. It's easy. It's easy. And and while that you know 
That certainly is the case for many people. For this group of people, it's not so simple because we can't work out what we find it very difficult to work out what their preferences are. So the act of preference expression is not unproblematic. It's really, really difficult. And these these time how many times do I hear people say it's not rocket science? Just listen to them, it is bloody rocket science. It's really, really hard. And while particularly people who are working in this field um, who are paid nothing, <laughs> their job is really, really hard. Really hard. And we spend, particularly as speech pathologists, as professionals coming into their environment, we spend so much time going, oh, they have a lot of idea and it's, it's a really hard gig that they have. So our research questions were um, sorry. Um, our research questions were around so in my thesis where the, the, the research questions were, were pretty much this. What I wanted to know was what does supported decision making look like for this group of people and what factors so what are the roles that, that people are supported and the supporter plays um, and what factors impact on someone's responsiveness to, uh, to someone. Uh, the method we use, I'm not going to go on about research because it's so boring, but I'm going to um, uh, just talk to you quickly about the, my method. Um, it's an action research, iterative research design. So what that means is that um, I used a supported decision-making um, model that I had developed um, and it changed along the way. So as participants taught me things, as they um, uh, worked with me, I could see, oh, I got that bit wrong. So the intervention changed. Till at the end, we had a brand new um, process, a brand new model. So there were five people. They all communicated informally and uh, they all had intellectual disability and their circles of support. Their circles of support for three of these people, um, no, none, they had, for three people they had no unpaid support in their life. So everyone that was in their circle of support was paid to be there. Just give you a second to think about that for a second. Everyone in your life that you have a relationship with is paid to be there. So consider that. No one in your life that is there because they supposedly want to be there. Um, and then we had two that um, had very uh, um, engaged family. Um, we collected data, we did um, facilitated group discussions, workshops. So um, each circle of support went through a workshop uh, process, a lot of observation, and we analysed the data phenomenologically. Um, <laughs> so this was the process that we used. This is the package of um, that that I used. Uh, it's a workshop. Um, so three to six months. This process was for each person. So we, what we did was focus on one particular decision that that person might be facing, and we worked through this process of um, decision making support. I was going to show you the video. There is a video you can get, you can go online. It's called "Listening to Those Really Heard." It explains the whole process, but I'm not going to show it to you now because I want to get to other things. Um, so this is the decision making framework that we used. So there were four phases, identifying a decision. I'm, I'm getting so blind, I can't read from there, I have to. Identify a decision and options together, listen together, explore options and build evidence together, make decision and act on it together. And at the same, all the time, documenting, 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 writing it down, or what we found was the most valuable was video. 
video video is just gold and I'll explain to you why the video was so, um, was so useful. The other thing that you'll see consistently through that model is this term together. In the initial um, model we didn't have that but what we saw was this really worked when people worked together, when that circle of support worked together. We were talking today about safeguards. It is a concern to me when one person is nominated as someone's support, a decision-making supporter. It is a concern, particularly for people who could be exploited. We need other people in that process. We need checks and balances. We need arguments. We need to say, no, you're wrong. I think you have an agenda there. I think you want to go on, you want to spend that money with him. It's you that wants to go to McDonald's, not him. So we need people to be called on it. Um, and I think that that collaborative process, which is what supported decision making is all about, is really important. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of an idea of what we did um, and how it worked. So this um, is a man called Tom, not a real name. We, um, uh, we, we thought as a circle of support that he was communicating to us that he was born on the weekends. Um, uh, he lived in a group home, which is an institution, and anyone who knows um, or spent time in institutions would know that a lot of people express boredom in, in those environments. Um, so the circle of support thought, well maybe he's got a bit of money, maybe we should explore, heaven forbid, doing something fun on a weekend. Um, uh, so that's what we did. We spent uh, probably about six weeks, six weekends exploring different activities with him. And then we chose these activities because as a circle of support, people said, um, you know, he really likes certain things. One of the things that they said that he really likes was warmth. He really likes warm things. So when he's in the shower, a, a wet face cloth, face washer, flannel, yeah, um, <laughs> um, might be put on his on his face and he loves that. One of the other things that he really enjoys doing is, um, and this can be very dangerous because in Australia, in a Melbourne summer, we can have, you know, 48 degrees and he loves um, corrugated iron, these sheds, that there's lots of them around and he loves to, to touch them, put his face on them and really explore them. So it's that sensory experience he really, really enjoys. Um, so we do have to be careful because they can get bloody hot and he can get burnt. Um, but I'm just going to show you a little footage of him exploring this. Is there a Ignore my voice. It's going to be good on your hands. It might be nice and warm too. Do you need the most sensitive spot on Can I Oh, come back for more. Okay, we had hours and hours of video of this. So what we did was we spent hours as a circle of support analysing that. Um, analysing that video, working out what he was saying, what he wasn't saying. How long we spent on that bit? You know how he's going in and out? Did he want her to take it in his nose or not? Uh, it was really hard. We came to the agreements because people who knew him well said, yeah, he does really like it. He was just sort of coming back. He did come back for more. But one of the things that we explored is that we saw, so we said lots and lots of video. We um, supported him to make a decision to spend some money on getting his own corrugated shed in the backyard of the group home. So he has that shed now. Um, uh, the issue is, lucky it was one of those um, ones that we can move around because it wasn't in the shade. And again, it, yeah, I, that was when I had sleepless nights. Is, is Tom going to be burnt by every every 48 degree day? I'm like, oh God, I need to ring the group home and say, don't, just be careful. Um, because they do, they just get so hot. 
Um, so, um, so now he spends a fair bit of his weekends um, hanging out in, with his shed. Um, the other thing that we, now that some of you have seen this video today, um, we did know that he really loves, there was no um, controversy around this, one of the things he really loves is wind on his face, he loves movement. So he will, he will, um, if a car, if, when he's in a car that's moving quickly and the window is down, he will take his, nearly his whole body out of that car to feel that, that sensation. Um, so we explored that. What is that? What activities could we do to, to help him um, experience that preference? So he, we took him to Luna Park, which is a, um, uh, what is it? Theme park, thank you. Um, in, in Melbourne, and he um, had a go on a merry-go-round. And we were really concerned about that. He'd never been on one. He is someone that can get very, very anxious. Um, and uh, it, it, it was concerning. But he doesn't, he doesn't smile a lot, Tom. He really doesn't. You saw in the other video, he's a very serious um, man. But I just want you to watch this video because it blew our mind. The other thing that I want to point out, which I didn't point out today, is that we've never heard him speak. And I want you to listen and see if you can hear something that was amazing for us. Oh. So we watched that on um, my colleague's phone. We thought, he's telling us he might want another ride. So we offered him that. He spent his money. Um, someone tweeted today after I talked about this that they were concerned that it cost $10 for the, um, <laughs> for the ride. Is that, is that, that person here? Oh, that's very funny. I, I laughed. Um, but yes, it was $10. Um, uh, but that's Australian dollars. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we supported him to make a decision to um, have another ride, and then another ride, and then another ride, and then another ride, until Luna Park closed that afternoon. Now, so many people would say that Tom isn't able to make a decision about how he spends his money, and there's no question to me who drove that decision that day. I wanted to go home. Everyone wanted to go home. But he wanted very clear from his unintentional communication that he was happy. Yeah? Now, I've got lots of video and I'm not going to show you all so because we're going to move on because we want some time for questions and interaction because um, I think that that's really important. But what we found in our research was that supported decision making, it was very clear there was two, for this, for people who communicated informally, there were two roles. The role of the person who expressed their preference, their will and their preference, and the role of the supporter. And what we found was that it was very clear what was amenable to change. The person with who was communicating unintentionally, there was no need for them to change. They were doing their bit. But the supporter needed to do a better job <laughs> at um, really responding to that person. So what we found was that the crux of that role was that they needed to be responsive to that person's communication. And one of the key things was acknowledge, so we, there were three components of that responsiveness. Acknowledgement of their will and preference, interpretation, and then action. Acknowledgement sounds really easy, but 
Again, anyone who spent time in an institution will know that so much communication goes on that isn't acknowledged, that is ignored. Again, why? Why? Because perhaps their personhood is in question. The next part was this interpretation. Once I acknowledge that you're communicating something to me, how do I interpret that? What we saw is that the key was collaboration. To do it collaboratively, to spend time with video and get um, everyone together and pause on video and rewind it and, and really hone in on what that person was saying. And then act on that preference. That's the easy part. Um, so, what we saw was that, as I said, that the role of supporters is to respond to expressions of preference, acknowledge, interpret, and then act. Um, so I'm going to flip through some of this, but the, the, this is the model that we came up with. Apparently, when you do a PhD, you're meant to come up with some kind of model. <laughs> so this is the picture that I came up with. I, I don't know. Um, but what I think is important about this is that there were five key factors that contributed to a person's, to a supporter's responsiveness to that person. Relational closeness. How close were they to that person? Supporters' attitudes and perceptions. Where a supporter believed a person was communicating, albeit intentional or unintentionally, where they believed they could make a decision, they were more likely to respond to that person. So that's where we need to build some capacity, eh? Um, a person's communication. It's not surprising if they were an unintentional communicator, they were very unlikely to be responded to. <coughs> the functioning of the circle of support, where there was willingness to collaborate, where there was respect within the circle of support. That was really important. For those of you who have worked in this area, you will know that there's often conflict, particularly between paid supporters and other paid supporters. The residential staff hate the day service staff because, God, everyone's doing it wrong. You know, they never get along. So that was really important. Where we saw conflict, that responsiveness was not there because they couldn't collaborate. They couldn't work out what was happening for that person. And then the other really important part um, that uh, someone just touched on was this idea of um, systems uh, putting barriers on, on processes, particularly relational closeness. So you can't be that person's friend because you're paid to be there. Again, I remind you, if you've got no one in your life who knows and loves you that isn't paid to be there, what the hell do you do? What does that do to your humanity? So, um, I'm going to just explore with you some of these things. Um, again, Maria, how am I going for time? You're on cat plastic. Oh, I can do this. Um, uh, so, so supporter attitudes, again, where there was a positive belief that someone could communicate and make a decision, they were more likely to be responsive. So um, let's look at some examples. So a supporter who was classified as responsive, you might be wondering the speeches in my room, in the room are saying, how did you know that they were responsive? Um, I developed an observational um, checklist, an observational chart. Um, which I can share with you, uh, where I measured responsiveness over a, um, a three-hour period. But that's, uh, yeah, I can talk to you about that. But where I found people were responsive, they said things like this. Yeah, he's communicating. He's communicating all the time, you know. Whether it's spitting, crying, you know, so many things. Oh, that warms my heart. Well, he's telling us things all the time, you know. You know what he wants to eat or doesn't want to eat. In contrast, people who were classified as unresponsive, they didn't respond to this person's 
um, preference expression. They can't, they can't tell us that, I'm sorry, they can't, they can't really tell us things, you know. They can't tell us, they haven't got a voice to speak. So it's the same, so it's some of the same quotes that I've already used. At the end of the day, people don't know who we're dealing with. So that kind of sentiment. <coughs> um, relational closeness, really important. So where people um, are used, I, I developed a relational closeness scale where, where people self-identified how close they were um, to someone, whether they were, had an intimate relationship, very close, close, um, not close or distant. And what we found was that um, there was uh, a real link between relational closeness and someone's responsiveness. Now that's not all that surprising. Um, but what, because of that, what we were interested in is what does this relational closeness look like? You can talk about relational closeness, but what does it really look like? And what we found was that knowing a person's life story, knowing their history, knowing where they've come from was really, really important. Because our identities do exist in our stories. When you get to know someone new, you, you talk about their history. You want to know where they lived, where they came from, where they've worked, who their family are. Who, who is this person? What, what is their life experience? Um, and this is a quote from um, a mother of one of the men who died during um, the study. A lot of people with um, severe and multiple intellectual disability die of what we call aspiration pneumonia. So two um, of the people that um, are supported in the study died that way. Um, and it's just another thing that really concerns me because is entirely preventable um, if we just don't listen enough to people's um, expression of, of uh, difficulties with their um, with pneumonia. So anyway, um, it was everything we all. This is she's talking about his wake. So the, the party that you have after the funeral, and I was asking her about the decisions that were made um, about what went on there. And it was everything that we all knew he wanted because you know, we know him love. We've known him all his life. And Dave reminded me, you know, his cousin, you know, the one with the hair, crazy hair. Um, he reminded me about the jelly slice that he loved before the pig. So the pig is a feeding tube. Um, when he was teen, so, so he could no longer eat orally anymore. So when he was teeny tiny, so we had to have that after, didn't we? With a cup, you know, he would have loved it. Um, and this is another support worker talking about um, uh, another um, uh, uh, another participant. It's just great to hear all the stories of what she got up to from her folks. You know, she's already had such an amazing life. Thanks to them, I really feel like I know her. Just looking at the photos, at the family photos and talking to about them, I feel really close to her, you know. Like I've known her all my life. Really though, I've only really worked with her this year. Now I think that that was really important because we think about relational closeness as a longevity of relationship. And, and yes, you know, the longer you know someone, you're probably more likely to be closer to them. However, for this group of people, again, they're not necessarily going to have long relationships. So it was really heartening for me to hear that, that this person was able to hear that person's story, hear that person's um, life history, even though she'd only known her for a year. And, she, and that was done through photos. Um, so it's a matter of exploring who this person is, asking the questions. The, um, the study also when we looked at relational closeness, we saw this idea of seeing a person beyond their disability. And Colbyn Ling from Norway um, came up with this concept many years ago, which I adopted in my research, which was purely to ask people if someone had complete control over their life, what would it look like? So if Kevin had control over the stereo in the bus, what would he listen to? Oh yeah, he likes some like rock music like ACDC, it's an Australian really 
Batman. Yeah, something with a bit of a guts. Yeah, you're right. Something with like the guts. Loud, loud, loud. Yeah, loud. I bet better, hey, Kev. A deep, heavy bass line, don't you reckon? Nirvana or maybe even Primus. So why the hell aren't we listening to Primus in the bus? <laughs> anyway, we're not. Um, if Nathan had control over his food, what would he eat? He'd be a foodie, I reckon. A foodie is a term that we use in Australia and that we use it here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, you know, he'd love food. You know, creamy, yummy cheese, flash wine, chocolate, the works. Guess what he was having for dinner? Not that kind of stuff. So we developed, we asked these questions and we've got pages and pages and pages of this kind of narrative that we were able to use to pull out what people's preferences might be. So it's just another way of trying to work out what what's that might be. Um, I'm going to move on from this one. Uh, so the functioning of the circle of support was really important. Uh, what we did, and I think that this was very interesting data, we, what I, I did was I videoed, again I use video, but I would show someone, one individual person, support worker, that video. And I would ask that person, what do you think this, what do you think he's trying to tell us? What do you think is happening? What, what are his preferences here? Yeah. So I would get that data, then I would take the same video to the group, to the collective. Because I wanted to see what difference it made when that interpretation happened individually and when it happened collaboratively. There was some very, very interesting data. I'll just quickly um, show you a video of this man um, been hoisted. Okay, I, I put the wrong video in there, but as that goes on, he um, becomes very vocal and he, he becomes very clearly distressed, very clearly distressed. As I put the sling on um, and we began to hoist him, he was very distressed. Uh, so what we saw was this very clear difference in the way people interpreted where they interpret it individually as opposed to collaboratively. So a support worker said, he's not saying anything. He's comfortable, I guess. I know I should see something in this. It's a trick question. <laughs> Maybe uh, I can't see anything. I don't know what he's saying with that noise. I don't get what you're asking, wanting me to do. Maybe I'm missing something. No, I just keep, keep him... No, nah, I'd just keep him in the sling. I don't know. Actually, yeah, so what she's saying is, oh, I don't know. I don't know. The same video and the same support worker who was part of this collaborative with the circle said, um, wow, look at that. Look at his face. Can you stop the video? I want to show you. Ah, I guess he looks a little stressed, I reckon. <laughs> When you pause it like that, you see his little mouth change. Looking at that, he isn't happy, not at all. So this supporter three was the same supporter that, that said, I have no idea. Um, listen, listen to that noise. That's a pissed off noise. Bloody hell, look at this. He, was, he wants to stay in his chair. Why didn't she just leave him there? <laughs> and to me, it was me, but I didn't <laughs> and put him in the sling. Um, so what we were seeing is that there was a real, a, a greater richness in that ability to interpret when, when, when it happened collaboratively. So they bounced ideas off each. Stop the video, let's look, no! So, and we have lots of data around, around this with all our participants. Um, now the characteristics of the support system and this is what I wanted to, we were talking about earlier, is um, 
I'm just going to, this idea of duty of care, which I'm not going to go into, if you're interested, we can talk about that a little more. Oh, actually, look, I will. Um, so this idea that duty of care, someone's duty of care as a paid support worker has, takes preference um, or takes precedence over someone's right for, for, to choose, um, you know, whether that be the use of sling or, or not. Um, but this quote I just loved. <laughs> um, uh, we really do try to listen to Ange and what she wants, don't we guys? But we just can't let her chase the work experience boys down the street. You know, we have a duty of care to her and to others, poor lads. It's tricky, it's like walking a tightrope. Some days juggling all this stuff and then, yeah, how much do I get paid again? <laughs> so this person, you know, really is grappling with that, you know, what do I do? I can't, you know, they were, it was pretty funny, they were 15 year old boys from the local high school that were there, you know, coming to the day service to do their community service, help the poor people with disabilities. And um, she loved them and she uh, really wanted to chase them down the street. I had no problem with that. But um, there obviously was this dilemma. Um, what we also saw, this is really interesting, what we also saw was that the more complex someone's communication or cognitive impairment was, the less likely they would be supported to take risky decisions, to make risky decisions. And we know the importance of taking risks in life. It's what makes us grow. It what's, it's what makes us um, uh, become the people that we are. Really important. So I just want to show you the difference. This was a decision about... Sorry, if I <coughs> ask, what, what do you understand to be our sexuality kind of in that regard? It's a risk. Uh, I don't think it's a risk. It's a particular <laughs> um, um, Can we talk about that at the end? Yeah, because I just want to finish these and... Um, yeah, partly because it's just too tricky for me not to. So the decision that both these men were dealing with was, and it comes up often in my work, is whether or not someone um, stops having oral food and has a pig. So they have their food, their nutrition um, into their stomach. Okay? So that's often a very big decision that people are faced with. So there were two men in the same week that were facing this decision. One of them was an unintentional communicator. The other one was not. So the unintentional communicator, this is a quote from one of his supporters. Well, he was aspirating all the time. It was just too risky. We had no choice. He was always in hospital with pneumonia. Nah, even if he could participate in the decision, he would have ha, had no say, it had to go, you know, it had, it had to go in, meaning the tube, you know, it was a matter of life and death. Ask Tina the speechy, that's just the way it had to be. <coughs> in contrast, exactly the same scenario, the same risk of someone who was able to communicate formally. Well, it was hard. Kev loves his food. I mean, he really loves his food. Hey guys, so we knew what he would prefer, but he had so many bouts of pneumonia and he got so sick. Remember that Christmas he was in hospital for <coughs> love? But we weighed things up and it was clear that he wanted to eat orally. So even though he now has the pig, we let him take risks and eat most days. It's just really important to him so it's worth the risk. That's what we reckon anyway. You see what I'm saying here? Yeah. Someone, it, 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 someone it, it's about cognition again, isn't it? I, I, I found that, when I found that in the data, it, it was amazing because it was, um, it, it, again, it was the same week that we were dealing with this decision, but the approach was so different. Yeah. Um, and I want to talk about this um, issue of relational closeness and system barriers that you talked about before. 
It was decided that the pair's relationship was wrong, that such a friendship was unprofessional. So this is a relationship between a support worker and, a, and someone being supported. This supporter, this, this person being supported, had no one in their life who wasn't paid to be there. So it was decided that the pair's relationship was wrong, that such a friendship was unprofessional and crossed the boundaries of what was acceptable. So it stopped. No more meals with the families. She, she used to take them home. Um, no more days out or festive fun. I've told her, so this is a manager um, saying this, that she shouldn't be dropping in there for a cuppa. She knows way too much about Neil and his family. It's okay that she shares superficial things with them, you know, tell them what, she, what movies she's seen and what she got up to on the weekend, stuff like that. But that should be it. She's way too open with him. I think she wants to be their friend. Um, so resource allocation, another factor. Oh, h &S. <laughs> You know, I reckon in our panic to make sure everyone is safe, mostly ourselves, the pendulum has swung too far. It's not really about the guys anymore. Well, as far as the bed goes, he likes a soft mattress. But other than that, I don't think he needs anything too pricey. I'm sure he would rather spend his money on other stuff, like a fishing rod. But you know, the powers that be say he has to have a super expensive whiz bang bed that's like low to the ground and that. So we don't hurt our backs. I mean, the message is that our needs are more important. Our needs are more important. Uh, more important. They just don't give a shit about what he wants. If staff safety is on the table, they're worried about getting sued. Yeah. And it comes up over and over again. What what about me? What about my duty of care? What about oh, if I get sued? And I say, have, have you ever been, you know, in, in court? Oh, have, uh, in my whole career, I've never known a support worker or a service provider to be sued because, because of this. Um, and I just want to finish with this. The starting point is not a test of capacity, but the presumption that every human being is communicating all the time and that this communication will include preferences. Preferences can be built up into expressions of choice, and these into formal decisions. From this perspective, where someone lands on a continuum of capacity is not half as important as the amount and type of support they get to build preferences into choices. And this was written by Beamer from Values in Action in 2001, well before the convention. Um, and it's something that, uh, it's, it's a quote that I, I'd love to go back to because I think it, it nails it. Um, What I've done in my research is reconceptualise this idea of decision-making capacity for people who, who don't communicate formally. So I think what we're talking about here is the ability of a person to make or participate in a decision, either independently or through a collaborative process of support from a group of people in the concerned person's life who know the way. This definition embraces the interdependent and collaborative range of decision making, particularly for people who communicate informally and sometimes unintentionally. And it rejects the notion of individualised decision making capacity. That is what